Welcome to a new episode of my Dear Kitchen Helsinki podcast. My guest today in this final episode of 2020 is Kirsi Chowda from CMM Pool Foundation. Kirsi and I talked about CMM Pool's work in general and with a particular focus on the team of rural women and food sovereignty, which is the funding team that she is coordinating. We also talked about food sovereignty in Finland and how this is all connected within the global food system. You can find out more about CMMPU Foundation on www.cmmpu.org. Hope you enjoy our discussion. A very special thanks to my dear friend Ufuk Evjiman for the sound editing since episode two, and I wish you all a peaceful end of the year. Okay, hello Kirsi, and hello, take- how are you? Uh, well, it's it's quite a dark day as usual, so I'm trying to be okay. <laughs> um, Hope you are fine too. Um, and thank you for accepting this, um, to do this interview. I found out about CMM Pool uh, just a few weeks ago when I was uh, making a research about food sovereignty and Finland. And it's, it's great that uh, we could uh, put together this interview in such a short time. Uh, so thanks again. Um, now I want to start uh, with a bit of an introduction. So uh, if you could introduce CMM Pool Foundation, what you do, uh, what it's about, but also your role in the organization. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, CMM Pool Foundation um, was founded by 15 Finnish environmental and development uh, NGOs uh, from the civil society uh, in 1998. Um, and uh, uh, the idea of Siemenpu is to support environmental work of the civil society uh, in in the global south mm-hmm. um, and uh, the civil society organizations and uh, social movements uh, working on environmental <coughs> thematic and uh, we have provided uh, grants for the civil society organizations in uh, in the global south since 2002 Mm-hmm. Um, our main funding uh, uh, comes from the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and then we do some fundraising ourselves too. And uh, these, all these projects uh, that we fund are designed and implemented by the local organizations um, in uh, Asia, Africa, and uh, still a little bit in Latin America as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we don't uh, implement them and uh, <clears throat> we don't have any offices there, but we only have our office in Finland and we support them by by granting them the funds to to carry out their own work. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we fund uh, projects in five different uh, thematics. Uh, one is called uh, Just Transition to Ecological Democracy. One is conservation and sustainable use of forest and coastal ecosystems. And then there's uh, biocultural rights of indigenous forest communities, and then rural women and food sovereignty, and climate and energy justice. So we have these five schemes um, where we fund uh, projects. And myself, I'm one of the three program coordinators at the CMM Pool. And uh, I, I work on this... Uh, uh, conservation and sustainable use of forest and coastal ecosystems scheme, and also uh, rural women and food sovereignty scheme. Uh, and I started working at uh, CMM Pool soon 15 years ago. Wow. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was away for a little bit in between, but uh, started in January 2006. Okay. Um, now, about talking about funding projects, um, first of all, what are some of the criteria that you consider when uh, funding of these projects? Um, well, we have this uh, uh, general uh, funding criteria, uh, which is quite a long long list, and then then each uh, scheme because they they are um, uh, they focus on different thematics, so uh, they have the thematic. Uh, criteria uh, but then the the general criteria that we have for the projects is that the uh, one concerning the <clears throat> the organization applying for funding uh, they need to be formally registered and uh, have the capacity to manage uh, project funding 
and uh, they should function in a, internally in a democratic uh, way and uh, sort of have their their uh, governance uh, in order and uh, reliable bookkeeping and uh, and this kind of um, basic expectations. And uh, from the projects themselves, we expect that they aim at improving the state of the environment and uh, uh, climate resilience and uh, <clears throat> And uh, so, and then uh, that they aim to strengthen the position of vulnerable groups of people and communities. Um, and that at the same time, it would be environmentally and culturally and economically uh, sustainable. And we expect that the communities, the <clears throat> beneficiary communities are involved in the design and the implementation of the activities. and. Um, we prioritize the, the most needy organizations and networks and movements, and uh, uh, we consider it important to strengthen uh, the weaker, weaker actors too. Uh, and then um, we, we consider important citizens opportunities for social participation um, in the democracy. And um, we, we want to support networking and collaboration between different civil society actors. And then we want to promote gender equality, um, women's and girls' rights, and uh, also the rights of uh, groups that face discrimination, such as uh, people with disabilities and indigenous peoples, um, and uh, altogether human rights um, are important to be taken into consideration and promoted. And all the activities that we support have to be non-violent. And uh, if possible, uh, the activities should be replicable so that someone else can, can uh, do the same in a, in a similar context. And uh, also we value in, innovative approaches. And uh, we, we uh, encourage the project implementators to um, implementers to uh, consider <coughs> approaches that uh, <coughs> kind of um, uh, uh, also tackle the structural um, factors so that they would contribute to a just transition to ecological democracy. Yeah, that's a long list. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so. As you said, you are doing your projects uh, through, or, or you are funding uh, the projects uh, through, you know, giving the, the funding to local partners such as NGOs and so on. So, how do you uh, communicate with your partners throughout the per project period? And also, um, how do you um, measure and monitor the impact of the of the projects that you give funding to? Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, for the formal communication uh, when when uh, someone uh, participates in uh, or sends a proposal to us um, in a, when we open an application window <clears throat> we have a standard form for for writing the proposal uh, and then uh, we have the uh, form for uh, making the funding agreement and uh, uh, in a regular project cycle, we expect uh, <clears throat> the um, implementer to send us a progress report and a final report of the project. So we have standard forms for, for doing that. And of course, they can also add anything else that they want to, but we have the, the basic, basic requirements for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> then we keep in touch uh, regularly by email, Skype, Zoom, and then... Uh, this kind of alternative Zoom type <laughs> uh, programs and uh, WhatsApp, for example. And then uh, we do field visits to the projects. And then uh, uh, when it comes to the impacts uh, in their project proposal, uh, the, the grantees uh, set uh, the uh, aims, the, the objectives for the, for the project. And uh, then <clears throat> Both on the short term, which would be uh, what would what they expect to uh, reach by the end of the project, and then also a longer term uh, goal, and then then uh, in the 
program uh, in the progress reporting and final reporting, we expect them to uh, report what happened to the, the aims that they set for themselves. Yeah. And, um, and then we discuss that with them. And uh, also sometimes we uh, commission external evaluations. So we, we uh, hire uh, someone externally to, to evaluate the projects. Often it would be then uh, like several projects at the same time or different kind of approaches for evaluating the, mm. the projects. So in, in many ways, we, we keep in touch with with the grantees all the time uh, I'm, I'm i'm wondering for the for example finished projects um after some time do you go back to see how it, it's uh, like after a project is completed and some time is passed do you go back and and check uh, how it's you know how the situation is uh, is there some kind of continuation of that Maybe not you, but again with some uh, with a, a middle uh, like true again with the same NGO or something. Is there a, is there any follow up in the future in, in the afterwards of the uh, the project is finished? Um, well, what, what we often do as well is that the, uh, we we um, grant uh, another. Uh, um, grant for the same organization as well. So, so often it's not only like one-off support, but uh, we continue with uh, the mm -hmm. same partners. So then, of course, we can see on a longer term um, what has happened in the in the same context and uh, what they are doing. Uh, and then uh, sometimes uh, partners that we have funded earlier, um, uh, they they work in the same. Uh, and networks than than organizations that we currently support, so we we can see them and uh, keep in touch. So, but <clears throat> it's not it's not often that we do a, a like an I think it's called ex post uh, evaluation that we would decide to pay someone to evaluate something that we supported say ten years ago and we haven't been in any touch with them. But uh, that would be very interesting. And for instance, now, uh, next year, uh, we have been able to uh, support uh, uh, civil society actors in Indonesia less than earlier. Uh, so what, what the, our partners in Indonesia wanted to do was to look at the, the because we have supported projects in, in Indonesia practically the, the whole time that we have existed mm -hmm. so the partners there wanted to like uh, analyze what has happened uh, since 2002 with our support from uh, to, to Indonesia mm -hmm. so they will carry out this kind of uh, review of uh, or systematization of our support to Indonesia mm -hmm. and it was their initiative so uh, we it's it's going to be very interesting to see what they find if yes. they managed to get in touch with all the all the organizations that we started supporting in 2002. Yes, because I mean, I asked this question because um, this kind of uh, development projects are not something made and done, but it's uh, mostly about, uh, especially the biggest impact is, it would be seen in the longer term if it's, you know, stayed and if it's, uh, uh, became permanent and if they could move on to another level then and so on so so that's why this this uh, this project about with the Indonesia um, then it would be very interesting for you to see in the long term what happens and if it creates a permit if it created something permanent um, yes. yeah um, so but what about Finland do you have any activities uh, within Finland <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, uh, our aim in, in Finland is to, to um, publish information and increase awareness about the realities in the global south, in the themes that we, we support there, and also the results of our support. Uh, so we do that via our, our website, by public, pu publishing um uh news stories and uh, and uh, blog there 
and also in social media. We are in on Facebook and uh, Twitter, and also um, uh, what's the what's the one uh, the picture one? Instagram. Instagram, yes, there. And uh, <clears throat> and then in addition to this uh, ongoing uh, information work. We also uh, publish uh, books as publications, and also we have uh, published another another website. Um, and uh, also we have done uh, other ways of uh, information work, for example, uh, through artistic means. Um, so different kind of uh, uh, ways to uh, create more awareness here in, in Finland. And <clears throat> in addition to that, we have collaborated uh, in some uh, global education projects implemented by some some other actors such, such as uh, FE Finland which is uh, part of an international network uh, um, for environmental education mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they did this uh, uh, material on climate change for for schools and uh, we provided uh, uh, some videos uh, from from the global south for that and then we have collaborated with the Helena Rautavara Museum. Uh, for example, right now there's, they have a, an exhibition uh, where we have provided stories and information from India and Indonesia and Nepal. Mm. So we try to collaborate because perhaps we have we have some information to um, uh, complement something that someone else like complement our strengths, for example, in the global education. Uh, for example, this uh, FE is uh, professional in, in providing uh, education materials and uh, how to how to do the education part. And then we have the, the content. So <clears throat> we join our forces. Mm. Great. Um, now I want to come to this the, the main topic that we um, that I want to discuss, which is rural women and food sovereignty, which is also your uh, the, the team that you're personally working on. Um, but before uh, we go deeper into this, uh, can you, for our listeners who may not be familiar with the term food sovereignty, uh, can you tell a little bit about what it is and uh, maybe talk a little bit about also food security versus food sovereignty um, and then uh, we can continue from there. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> well often food security is uh, uh, is more used as a concept and uh, that refers mainly to having uh, uh, enough uh, healthy and uh, appropriate food to, to secure people's need to needs to nutrition whereas the <clears throat> the civil society movement uh, farmers movement uh, has established these uh, six pillars of uh, the concept of food sovereignty and it also sees important uh, the people's right to food uh, which is healthy and culturally appropriate mm -hmm. um, uh, but then in addition to that uh, uh, it considers important uh, the uh, the value of the people who provide the food. So uh, uh, it emphasizes on the the small scale farmers um, uh, power and uh, position and respect and uh, uh, to make sure that the, the small scale farmers are not uh, <clears throat> their rights are not violated and uh, they are not uh, harassed and uh, discriminated and also it puts emphasis on the localizing the food system uh, so <clears throat> the, the like local aspect of uh, food production and uh, and uh, consumption and uh, also the, the co local control of the uh, of the food system so to say and uh, it aims to build knowledge and skills um, uh, from the bottom up mm. and uh, revitalize the, the, the traditional uh, systems and uh, and um, the, the diversity of food production mm. and uh, also it works with nature so that um, uh, the food sovereignty uh, requires 
production and distribution systems uh, that protect the natural resources and uh, reduces greenhouse gas emissions and uh, avoids energy intensive industrial methods mm. uh, that damage the environment and the health of uh, of those who, who inhabit <laughs> here. So that's the kind of difference. It's, a, it's seen more as a power, a question of power as well, power yeah. and rights. Yeah, and it's, um, I think it's gaining more importance and more higher voice uh, now, uh, more and more. And uh, thanks to the people who are working on, who have been working on this uh, movement for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And people are, I'm, I'm hearing more people are talking about food sovereignty rather than food security. Um, and well, just currently, we have, there is also the biggest, big, uh, the biggest uh, protest in history in India with the farmers, and which is rooted in food sovereignty again. Uh, so I think we're going to hear more about this and hopefully the policies uh, i mean it will it will translate into policies more uh, the, the whole idea of food sovereignty and all the six pillars that you that you uh, mentioned uh, but coming back to rural women and uh, food sovereignty uh, team um, now what are some of the challenges that rural women are facing in the global south i mean in general but also of course in relation to food Yes, I, uh, maybe I'll look at it more from, from based on the experiences that uh, uh, we have seen in the, the, the work that we have supported. Uh, I think uh, very often the, the challenge that women uh, face, uh, the uh, small scale uh, producer women uh, in the South is uh, access to land and uh, the security related to land uh, uh, holding land uh, whether it's uh, collective or or um, individual rights to land so that that's one big question and also <coughs> access to other means of production such as uh, seeds and uh, and other means and uh, also access to um, to uh, seeing uh, experiences of sustainable farming practices like training and also exchange of, of experiences with other farmers and also uh, one one severe question is also of course the, the impacts of climate change and the insecurity brought by by uh, the changing climate and uh, uh, especially the the uh, the predictability of the uh, weather conditions that has has changed and also then uh, gender-based uh, discrimination and uh, violence as well. Um, those those are mm-hmm. uh, big challenges. Uh, this team in within CMAMPU, has it always been uh, in CMAMPU, like this specifically rural women and food sovereignty, or is it is it rather new? Um, this this gendered perspective of. Uh, yeah. Of these challenges, uh, how long have you had this this team uh, specifically as a separate thing in, within CMMPU? Actually, uh, how it is called now, uh, we established it in uh, 2018 in this this current program period that we have, which is uh, for four years. Uh, but it has always been uh, at the at the beginning, when CMMPU started funding uh, projects, we didn't have any specific uh, uh, thematics. So uh, we had a, an open call at, on our website and anyone could apply. Mm. Uh, but since then, we, we closed this continuously open call and uh, uh, started working on these different themes. So it has kind of evolved uh, a bit, bit okay. by bit. But uh, for one of our longest or few of our longest partners in this uh, uh, topic has actually been um, Mali Folk Center in in Mali, uh, where they have worked with uh, groups of especially women uh, in the in the countryside on on um, agricultural production, and then also in Latin America. <coughs> actually, if you if people <laughs> understand Finnish, I just wrote a blog. 
uh, on our website about the collaboration that lasted for 14 years in Latin America, which was like a regional project uh, supporting um, uh, the theme of uh, <coughs> agricultural biodiversity uh, and very much working with the, the regional Via Campesina, which is uh, the main... <laughs> main part of the people participating in it are, are women but we didn't call this uh, scheme what it's called now but uh, we have supported mm -hmm. uh, similar work for, for quite a long time yeah and it is i mean this as a team itself rural women and food sovereignty this is a this is a massive topic um so do you have i mean does cmm pool have a specific approach to this topic and also the challenges that we just uh, talked about, um, um, like, like for example, you're in, you're trying to empower women, but through women's entrepreneurship or through education or through societal change, or maybe through a combination of things. Uh, is there a specific approach? Uh, well, <clears throat> of course. Uh, finally, uh, it always depends on how the. The organizations who who apply for funding from us, uh, how they define it. So uh, because we don't, we just uh, give the kind of uh, guidelines. But then, <clears throat> then we never know what kind of proposals uh, we receive. And uh, it's always nice to see how how the people in in uh, the global south see the the what should be done. Yeah. But uh, currently, uh, the projects that we support. Um, one important uh, <clears throat> angle is uh, the agroecological approach to farming, mm. uh, which is basically, uh, which means uh, that it's uh, like respect of uh, native seeds and uh, the crop varieties and uh, organic uh, fertilizing and pest control and uh, uh, combined with the with the empowerment of of the farmers <clears throat> themselves and all these land questions and uh, and it, other other questions and uh, empowering women like uh, working on you know, on women's groups in the local communities and also uh, the importance of uh, the initiative uh, initiatives being women led uh, that's what we have uh, tried to emphasize lately that uh, that that we also want to see women in the in the lead of of the processes to make it reality. Yes. <laughs> so those are maybe the the, the common common nominators of, mm -hmm. of the current projects that we support. Um, can you give some specific examples of uh, projects that you've funded uh, so far? Continuing uh, or, or and it's uh, specifically on this team. Like a couple of maybe examples. Yes, uh, for example, in in Mozambique, currently we uh, we fund uh, something uh, an organization called Libaningo, uh, and they work with the local communities uh, in Nampula uh, in in Mozambique, uh, and then they have they have um, uh, worked with local uh, women's groups in in some communities providing them with this uh, farmer to farmer methodology they have uh, there's a, a, a local kind of like a facilitator who, who goes to the the villages and uh, uh, shows uh, she's a farmer herself and she has learned these uh, this agroecological uh, farming uh, before and she shows the local women's groups um, and the, the methodology uh, <clears throat> involved in agroecological farming uh, and in that way the, the, the local women can uh, well they can they get more diversified um, uh, crop and also they can save in, in not buying uh, these uh, 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 seeds from uh, from these multinational companies and they don't need to buy the the <clears throat> chemical uh, fertilizers or or uh, uh, pest control <clears throat> but they 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 learn how to make uh, how to compost and uh, how to farm in a more environmentally friendly manner and uh, 
how to produce uh, like uh, organic pest control um, and this kind of things and also it's about uh, included in the project is the like gender dimension so that they talk about uh, uh, gender-based violence and uh, like land land ownership and land land management issues and uh, like um, the uh, getting together as as women's groups and uh, defending their rights and then we have a, another similar project uh, implemented by Justicia Ambiental in Mozambique, where they have worked for a very long time with the uh, community close to the Mabu forest. And uh, they have been uh, together uh, planning how to, how to reduce the stress on the forest and how to learn to cultivate in an agroecological way. And then in Liberia, we also have uh, similar similar projects uh, where where uh, groups of community uh, women in communities uh, they set up these uh, like kind of model plots to learn these uh, uh, ideas of agroecological farm, uh, farming, and uh, the idea is to, to then pass the information to to more people and uh, learn learn different diversified wide ways of, of farming okay. and actually in Liberia uh, the project one of the projects also involves setting a, setting up a community bank okay um, now how can you situate this topic this theme of rural women and food sovereignty um, within the challenges of the whole challenges of the global food system? It's actually a very, very topical question because uh, next year, I believe in, in the, within the United Nations um, uh, general meeting, there will be a, a specific meeting on the, the food system. Um, so it, it's a topical uh, theme also for the whole whole global community, but um, I think it's very central because uh, uh, I think it's necessary to to uh, focus on the ownership uh, of small scale farmers who produce the majority of the food uh, uh, for for the humankind, and uh, also because uh, um, this globalized industrial food system uh, is very vulnerable. So I think uh, the vulnerability of food production uh, uh, would be dramatically decreased uh, if, if the uh, diversity was uh, taken better care of. So, mm. so it's important for all of us to, to avoid these global vulnerabilities and uh, focus more on the local local level and also the lo uh, global industrial uh, scale and the way it's done uh, also produces uh, a lot of waste in in each step so it's important to to rethink yeah. how to how to produce food for for all of us mm -hmm. um now, of course, uh, your uh, the, the projects that you're funding, your work is uh, mainly in uh, global south, but I want to come back to north now. Uh, I'm about to bring the discussion uh, to north. Um, what do you think about food sovereignty in global north and especially in Finland? And what kind of challenges or do you think there are any challenges Finland is facing in relation to food sovereignty? Yeah, <clears throat> as as I said earlier, Siemenpuu doesn't work on on these things directly in Finland, so this is more my my own yeah. own view. But uh, uh, I think Finland is facing the same same challenges as the the whole world when it comes to this uh, industrial um, uh, food system. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at the Finnish uh, food sovereignty or, or the challenges in it. Uh, I think uh, a dependency on, uh, on 
uh, inputs that come from from elsewhere is is one of the big uh, challenges. For example, how much is the, our, our uh, agriculture based on uh, fossil fuels, mm. and what does that cause? What what if what if we stop using fossil fu- fuels? Would we still be able to produce food here? Mm-hmm. And and also other imports such, such as uh, animal fodder. Uh, so soybeans for example uh, for for animal fodder uh, we are dependent on on these kind of uh, inputs from from elsewhere and uh, we are causing uh, uh, problems elsewhere uh, where these kind of commodities are are produced and then for example also seed rights uh, here in finland too uh, the the native uh, seeds of for example uh, um some some uh, um, some beans um, is an important question, and also I'm I'm wondering how to encourage encourage people eating um, healthier and environmentally more sustainable food, um, and also climate wise uh, healthier healthier food, and uh, often or mostly I suppose. Uh, healthy food and uh, environmentally sustainable food uh, those cr- criteria go hand in hand so how, how could we change this system into something more mm-hmm. more sustainable both for us and for the the, the, uh, the environment I'm, I'm thinking about this question a lot uh, these days especially uh, in a country like Finland uh, which is uh, well, I come from Turkey, so it's the, the situation is very much different. People are more aware of things, of course, here. Uh, so I'm seeing, uh, I mean, and I've been living here for 10 years. I'm seeing more and more people interested and, and in trying to, uh, you know, eat healthier and uh, dif- trying different uh, diets, but also uh, thinking more about where their food is coming from. But I'm seeing still it's, it's, it's a small group still, like a, or it's a certain group, and I'm thinking, how can we uh, increase this awareness in the in the whole country, in the whole Finnish uh, mm. society? Um, so that's a big question. But but also uh, at the same question uh, with Finland and food sovereignty, do you think there is also a gendered perspective, even though Finland is a uh, you know quite. Uh, gender equal country but do you think any gendered perspective uh, when it comes to Finland and food sovereignty? Mm, that, that would require some <laughs> some yeah, further, you further have- thinking but uh, yeah I, I think um, it would be interesting to study for instance uh, what 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 is how, how do you how how does it how does women's and men's uh, food uh, preferences how do they differ for example and uh, what is the situation of uh, farmers in Finland uh, how many are men how many are women and what do they produce and uh, and uh, mm-hmm. that would be a very interesting topic but uh, unfortunately I don't have further information but one one thing I, I saw you have been to uh, Omama yes mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I'm also part of another similar uh, um, initiative called Kaupunkilaisten Oma Pelto, uh, which is also a community-supported agriculture uh, initiative. Uh, and there has been a lot of thought uh, put on how how to how to make these kind of initiatives uh, uh, run on longer term and uh, people's commitment and uh, kind of the idea of exactly. Uh, empowering the also the farmers and uh, and uh, because nowadays you can get uh, uh, quite a few organic products also from the supermarkets. So how do these community supported agriculture initiatives differ from uh, going to the local shop and buying uh, mm. organic things they have there? And uh, where, where I think it's it's a lot. It, it's got a lot to do with the power question who has the power is it the retailers or uh, a lot of questions to ask <laughs> yeah. yeah and 
I mean, being a foreigner myself or, or an immigrant myself, of course, there's also a whole immigrant community that I know who are, uh, who are mostly, for example, buying their food from ethnic markets, such as the Turkish market in Itakeskus, for example. Um, <laughs> how, how can we also involve them? Because Finland is becoming more and more diverse. Uh, it's mm. getting more and more uh, immigrants, immigration from different cultures and, and this cultured uh, and gendered perspective could be interesting also to check, uh, not just for, you know, and how do maybe even people change over time when they are exposed to more of these things as they stay in Finland? I mean, I myself changed in the 10 years that I lived here, even though I came here to study sustainability myself. So I was already motivated and interested, but I learned even more, uh, especially when it becomes your lifestyle, like you are living in a country that prom tries to promote these things, of course, things change. Yes. So, so I'm very interested in, in this uh, immig immigrant uh, point of view to like different cultures. Um, yeah. How do we involve, in, involve them in this uh, question? Because if we are going to talk about sustainable food future, it's going to be the food future of all of us, not a certain yes, people. Yes. Um, and how do we make it and people's move? movement so that's a big question but uh back to uh now i have I, I asked this question also before with some other um i guess um that when we talked about sustainable food systems um what is uh i mean there's generally like no, global no, north doing some kind of as as uh, your uh, local partners uh, working on development projects and things but how about if we reverse the thing so how about um, global north learning something from global south is there anything what do you think uh, can north uh, learn from south but also do you think there is such a big like divide, such as north and south, yeah. like a, such a you know sharp mm -hmm. divide, or a bit different, uh, a bit complementary maybe. Or what do you think about that? Mm. Well, as we already discussed, uh, I think we are all in the end uh, part of the same global food system. So in that way, we are in the same boat, as as you could say. But uh, I think uh, one thing that uh, we could uh, learn and uh, reflect on here in the global north, when it comes to the global south, uh, is doing things together and uh, building movements. Mm. Uh, I think that's that's one uh, one thing that maybe uh, we have lost here with all this um, abundance of of uh, of things that we have. Uh, maybe we have lost uh, mm. lost something about coming together and building movements. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, now, of course, we cannot not talk about COVID-19. Um, so how did COVID-19 affect your work and maybe the projects that you have been funding? And also, how do you see the future of uh, these kind of development projects? But also, I mean, in CMM pools, uh, future uh, post COVID-19. Mm. Uh, well, yes, uh, COVID has had an influence on, on how we work. Uh, well, here at the office, uh, practically our daily work has been affected because uh, uh, I, I don't see my colleagues. Uh, mm -hmm. I see them mostly online but because I come to the office, but uh, uh, other people, um, or two of us come to the office and three work uh, at their homes, so uh, I miss those uh, coffee moments to share ideas and uh, just to talk about uh, this and that. And uh, also, one one thing what has happened is that uh, this year, since the COVID uh, pandemic, we haven't been able to visit the projects. So <clears throat> I I really miss uh, being able to go there, go go to see people and see how they do things and. Uh, not only read things on paper, but uh, to see see in reality how how things happen. Because uh, we can have uh, uh, a Zoom conversation with, uh, for example, the the responsible person at the the organization that we support, but yeah. uh, we can't take the Zoom into the fields of the community and uh, see yeah. what what actually happens. So that's what I miss. 
And uh, when it comes to the project, um, uh, a lot of the, the kind of work we support is based on people meeting each other. So that's where the problem comes because uh, now it has been, uh, well, many countries have had these uh, restrictions and uh, of course you have to consider to not, not, uh, to not pass the disease <clears throat> around, but uh, how, how to meet with people, uh, how, to, how to exchange experiences and uh, provide trainings and things without being able to be together. So, but I, I'm amazed how, how well the partners have still been able to implement the projects, but uh, they have had to use a lot of innovative ideas on, on how to do things with all these restrictions. And then post COVID, um, which I hope someday will <laughs> will yeah. will uh, turn out. Um, uh, when it comes to overall to development cooperation, uh, I'm not sure what will happen, but uh, it has been discussed that uh, the COVID pandemic has uh, increased poverty and and hunger. So. Uh, so it remains to be seen how to how to retackle uh, these issues that for a long time, uh, at least according to the statistics, uh, poverty has been on on the decrease. But uh, what will happen now when when uh, when COVID uh, disappears? And then uh, um, with our partners, uh, I think the the future uh, would be to be able to meet up again oh. between people <laughs> I, I don't think the the pandemic has changed the the uh, uh the necessities and the the vision that uh, the organizations we support have so that all that work is still very necessary and uh, hopefully people can meet up freely again and uh, oh. continue um I'm just wondering uh, now that this is a pandemic that disrupted more, most many things in the world and it's also the projects that you've been doing, but have you had uh, before any other um, like something happening that disrupting the project like some conf like these are vulnerable communities, maybe some in, in some parts of the world, which are also prone to sometimes maybe more conflicts like any any kind of conflict that happened that disrupted the works? Do, that, do these things happen or is it more smaller communities and you could continue without um, a pandemic or anything else uh, easily doing, doing the work? And, and does there some kind of a, um, how to say, um, crisis management in this kind of, uh, if, if there is any a kind of disruption that happens like this? Uh, well, <clears throat> in uh, earlier occasions that I come to my mind, for example, if there's been a, a hurricane or, uh, uh, say, for example, uh, <clears throat> what has happened in Brazil after, after the current government started, mm -hmm. um, it has changed. For example, in Brazil, we support the, the um, traditional uh, gatherer people in the, the Amazon region. And of course, this uh, this current uh, governance in Brazil has changed the situation dramatically. But uh, in many many times, uh, uh, the conclusion is that those people cannot just stop because they live there and it's it's their life. So so life has to continue, and uh, then uh, new ways to tackle the situation need to be thought of. And the same, for example, in this uh, COVID situation, in some projects. Uh, um uh, when when it has been possible to visit the communities for the um the grantees uh they have changed their way of uh, working for example so that they take soap and uh, uh, um, uh masks and uh, information about covid to the communities when they go there and uh, uh just try to to think what is the best way forward but yeah. basically whatever we support the, the people continue living there and uh, and life needs to go on that's yeah of course uh, that's the benefit of you uh, 
carrying out the projects through local partners so people who are actually living and working there and know the communities and know the projects so they can make their this kind of motiv modifications easily and become more um, resilient in that sense. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, so these are my questions, all my questions. Do you have any final words or comments that you want to share? And uh, I want to uh, repeat uh, that uh, people can find you on uh, your website, which is cmampool.org. Um, and there's also the English version uh, of the, in the website. And they can also find you on Instagram, Twitter, uh, um, and Facebook. But I think these are, your communication on these channels are mostly or mainly mainly in Finnish, is it? Uh, yes, yes. Sometimes on Facebook there might be something in, in English and many times the the links there might be in, in English, but the, the, whatever words we put there might be in Finnish, but mm -hmm. the, on the website there's an English site. Okay, so people can, can follow you uh, through these, but yes, any final words and comments you might have? Yes, the one, one comment I wanted to, to say is that uh, uh, food sovereignty is a delicious topic <laughs> because, because uh, sometimes these uh, topics are quite far away and you, you think how, how do they relate to my life. But uh, this is a topic that we can all ponder our daily choices uh, right here, right now. So it's a delicious topic. Yeah. And, um, and thank you for, for listening to this and uh, yeah. hope you have a nice, nice festive season. Yes, the, well, um, I'm mostly working from home, so <laughs> there's uh, my own business. So uh, it's been quite a, quite a, calm season for me of course um, but uh, there's still some holiday coming and I'll, again for you as well uh, I think very soon maybe today you're going into like the, the holiday period so yes. um, I wish you a uh, Merry Christmas and um, New Year also and I'm going to continue of course following um, CM Ampu's work and maybe hopefully one day we can talk again and or you know, discuss things even further. So thank you yes. and um, bye. Thank you.